I'm Shan Storland, and in San Antonio, military means local. This is Military City, a podcast from ExpressNews.com. San Antonio Express News senior reporter Sig Christensen was embedded with the 3rd Infantry Division during the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq in 2003 and has reported on military-related topics for decades. Here on the podcast, each week, Sig and I will discuss the military stories important to San Antonio, both from today and the past. Now, Sig, you've been covering the ongoing issues regarding the safety of pilots while operating the T-6A Texan II Air Force trainer aircraft used in San Antonio and elsewhere around the country. And recently, you reported on a major breakthrough with that story. As we'll discuss, the problems that have been reported for some time may finally have been solved. But first, before we get to that, let's talk about this aircraft and its history in San Antonio. The T-6 is the Air Force's primary trainer. There are 444 of them in the fleet, and they are used to train novice pilots at four undergraduate pilot training bases around the country. Now, this is a prop plane. It's aerobatic. It's fast. uh, But uh, apparently it's forgiving because uh, somebody who's young and inexperienced, say you've got 20 hours, you you need a plane that... uh, is going to be fairly easy to handle, I would presume. And so that's how they train the uh, young pilots. And and so instructor pilots throughout the Air Force are responsible for training these young guys and women. And, uh, and, And they, in some cases, have been very concerned about the aircraft because of its onboard oxygen generation system. That system provides oxygen to the pilots and that's not a small thing. Once you get up above 12, 13, 14,000 feet, you are going to be on oxygen. And if anything goes wrong with that system, it can kill you. You can lose consciousness. Uh, you can feel woozy. You can get sick. Uh, you can lose control of the airplane. And there was a case with a uh, F-22 in 2010 in which the pilot was uh, either unconscious or unable to handle his aircraft for 39 seconds and he crashed and was killed. That was a very concerning incident. A lot of pilots in the Air Force all suspected that the pilot lost consciousness due to hypoxia, a lack of oxygen. So nobody really knows what the problem is, but we can tell you briefly uh, that the OBOG system in this plane has had a lot of problems. Uh, They have had dozens of unexplained physiological episodes, incidents in which a pilot gets sick, gets woozy, can't remember parts of the flight. There was a case in San Antonio where the pilot didn't know which, whether he was the lead aircraft or a, a follow or, or the aircraft following the lead. That was unbelievable because pilots always know who the lead aircraft is, especially instructor pilots. Uh, he could not remember half the flight the next day. So it was a pretty serious development. And I've heard of other stories that I can't confirm, but the problem is real. Uh, the Air Force has identified it as a problem. And uh, the short of this is that uh, in an interview last week, the Air Force Chief of Staff, who is the number one commander of the Air Force, his name is David Goldfein, told me that they have fixed the problem. They, they know what the problem is anyway, and they are going to move to fix it. One last thing, he wouldn't tell me what the problem was. He's citing something called safety privilege. Uh, and, uh, and when you've got a safety privilege, you can't discuss details of the investigation in public. And so there we are. That's where we stand. Uh, but uh, pilots are anxious to learn what the problem is. They really want to fix. That was a great introduction to our first clip with uh, Air Force Chief of Staff General David Goldfein. Let's take a listen to that. I'm I'm confident that the team has come to an answer. I do want to dig into this engineering piece of it because as as the chief, I I owe it to the force to make sure that I understand the next level of detail of this. But what I've been briefed to date, my confidence is very high that uh, we've, we've isolated it and determine the root cause, and we're going to have and we're going to have good fixes in place. And I, and I, I wish I could tell you what it was. I just got to I got to let our process play out. 
So, Sig, as we just heard, the Air Force has yet to release information regarding what exactly the problem is or how they've fixed it. Is that surprising to you? Would that be normal for this type of situation? I would expect that to be the case. Um, it's unfortunate because we have been the paper of record on this story. Uh, we have been out there interviewing all kinds of people about it, including a number of instructor pilots who came to me. They, they were that upset. They went outside of their chain of command. They went outside of the rules, which require them to go through public affairs officers to speak to a reporter. They came to me. And I can tell you that their concerns were uh, forcefully made. They were extremely detailed and they did not hold back. Uh, they feel like there is a real gap here between uh, what the Air Force is telling them and what they know, uh, particularly about uh, the problem. They, they, they feel like they have not been told uh, enough about the, uh, the, the severity and detail of these UPEs, as they're called, unexplained physiological episodes. So when they happen, they, they uh, end up hearing about it through the rumor mill. Pilots, of course, know each other and they talk. They're all professionals. They have a forum on the internet that you can go to. And uh, sometimes that forum looks a little bit more like rumor than any kind of fact. But every now and then somebody writes something that's really interesting. And we have cited it in previous stories. What these pilots said, though, uh, basically came down to concerns that the Air Force is not telling them enough about uh, the illnesses that these uh, other pilots have suffered. Uh, they're not telling them enough about what uh, things they could do to fix it. And, and some of the pilots were also uh, unhappy that the Navy seemed to do a better job when they investigated and, and corrected this problem. And another training aircraft called the T-45 Goshawk. And they basically said, why aren't they doing the same thing uh, in the T-6 that the Navy did in the Goshawk? And uh, as you'll see, uh, when you read the story and, and as you hear this podcast, uh, uh, General Goldfein, uh, the Air Force Chief of Staff, even concedes that the Navy has done some things really well. And uh, the Air Force, by the way, is working with the Navy. One last point, and this is a real important one. The Air Force says they've fixed, the, they found the problem. They've identified the root cause, as it's called, of these UPEs. And they say they are going to come in and make some fixes. The Navy continues to investigate uh, the, the, the mystery of these physiological episodes. And that suggests that they have not found the root cause. The Navy and the Air Force are working together on this. That's a real contradiction. So, Sig, you just mentioned UPE several times. That's one of many terms in the safety investigation that we should probably explain. Tell me about safety privilege and cost as well in relation to this topic that we're discussing. Safety privilege is, uh, is, is used to allow people to give fully open and honest uh, testimony about say, their physiological episode without repercussion. Uh, safety privilege is given when they're trying to figure out if there's a mechanical issue and did somebody do something wrong on the ground. So they're trying to get to the true cause of the accident. And in uh, a safety investigation, uh, they are not going to seek out retribution against somebody for having done something wrong or not following something by the book. Uh, there is a disciplinary process that deals with that, and, and it can be used. But uh, in this case, it's important to the Air Force that the facts of their investigation not be leaked to the public. Uh, one of the interesting things in safety privilege was that it was not used uh, to, to prevent pilots from discussing the UPEs, which are unexplained physiological episodes. And so the pilots told me about a case involving a instructor pilot who fell ill during his mission. He uh, asked the pilot that he was training, uh, are we lead? And the pilot responded, uh, no, they're lead. And, and this was a moment of, of astonishment to most pilots because every pilot briefs up 
uh, before the mission on who's going to be doing what at, at a particular point in the uh, in the flight program. And this is all rehearsed before they leave and go up to fly. They uh, follow this plan pretty much to the letter. Uh, and he should have known, but he didn't. And And then later, he had other issues. The next morning, he woke up and couldn't remember half of the mission. That's extremely unusual. And so they told me about this, and I put it in the story, and the Air Force reacted pretty badly. They were not happy to see that in the newspaper. Uh, nobody called and complained to me, but the next thing I heard was that the pilots had all been told that uh, UPEs from here on in would be treated as safety privilege, meaning that they could not talk about them with me. And, you know, I always work on the uh, assumption that I'm doing my job when I put things in the paper that people have a right to know. In this case, uh, this isn't just something that affects pilots in the air. It affects people on the ground. There are subdivisions all over the place around Randolph Air Force Base where these guys take off and land. And there are more of them than there used to be. In fact, it has become a concern of the Air Force, and we've written about it. Uh, sometimes if a pilot gets into trouble, uh, they're going to really look hard at how to resolve the situation without ejecting. In Del Rio last November, there was a flight like that involving a T-38. The T-38 had a gearbox malfunction in one of the engines, and then it quickly ended up causing catastrophic engine failure in the plane. That meant that they had to eject. The pilot stayed with the plane until the very last second. He had about six seconds left before the plane crashed. And he held on that long before uh, ordering them to eject because he wanted to make sure they did not hit the houses that were below them. The plane crashed between two subdivisions. Well, that pilot had the misfortune of failing to arm his ejection seat and he was killed. The other pilot ejected successfully with minor injuries. But this isn't a theoretical problem. This is something that really happens all the time. And if anybody knows anything about Del Rio, they will know that it is a fairly rural place. And yet, uh, people on the ground were at risk. So when I write about this, it's not just about the pilots, although I do write from their perspective as much as I can since this affects them. But I'm also writing for the reader on the ground who could end up be being part of a catastrophic accident. And so I wish the Air Force had been more forthcoming about those incidents because uh, it's not just their business. And uh, General Quast, just for everyone's edification, he is actually the guy who is going to sign off on the uh, Safety Investigation Board report. So uh, he has commanded the Air Education and Training Command for, I guess, close to a year. Uh, I'm a little fuzzy on when he took command, but uh, he is going to review the report, I am told, next week. Uh, and, and he will have to sign off on it. We hope sometime in the course of his doing that to be told what uh, the root cause is and to be told what the way forward is. Uh, if we are told what the way forward is, we'll put that along with the cause in the story. We have really been waiting and hoping to tell that part of the story now for some time, for months, because everybody wants to know. Uh, everybody in the Air Force and people who are living on the ground near Randolph Air Force Base and anybody out there in the T-6 Nation, as they call it, they're all waiting to know what happened here and and how it can be fixed because confidence is a huge issue and if you don't have confidence in your car getting you to the office you're going to be nervous from the moment you step into your car until the moment you get there their nervousness is a little more profound uh they're breathing air from a device that has uh documented failures in it and that's not a that's not a joke to anybody it's a serious serious problem. And, and we can't wait to tell people what the problem is and how they're going to fix it. 
And we just have a few moments left, Sig, so let's get to our final clip. Of course, this is not the first time they've had an investigation into the safety of an aircraft. And you asked the general about one particular plane that taught the Air Force quite a lot in this regard. So we learned a really, uh, really valuable lesson from the F-22. Um, when we went through that, we actually uh, we kept the confidence of the pilots longer than we kept the confidence of the families. We actually lost the families first because we stopped talking. And so my, so having come through that and having to restore the confidence, and the reason we lost the confidence of the families is when, you know, when, the, when their husband, uh, wife, you know, F-22 driver was not being able to give them answers, the family started really worried about, okay, what's going on here? And we stopped talking to them. So throughout this one, we've, we've been as transparent as we could be uh, going through it. I mean, I know that uh, Jill Quast, uh, Jill Doherty, they have been out on speaking tours. Teams have gone out. We've had, we've had briefing teams, uh, interim, uh, you know, in, in the report, as we, as we learn things, we sent teams out. So I don't doubt that you're going to get, you know, that, that we'll, we'll get some independent, you know, folks who are saying, hey, I'm, we're not being as transparent as uh, we need to be, and I take that criticism. Um, I can just tell you that, that we've done everything we can to make sure that the pilot force uh, has been included in this as we go forward. And, uh, and you know what, we owe it to them that, and we owe it to the families. There are, there are teams right now that are going to go to every T-6 base, and we would normally not do this until the, the report was signed out, you know, all complete. But this one is so important that we have teams that are actually on the road uh, I think John Quas will find this out for sure, but I think John Quas told me that like either this week or next week, um, teams are out talking at every one of the bases. It'll stay within safety privilege, uh, but I also understand our obligation to. We have several several members of Congress that are very personally interested in this, Congressman Turner, others, and so we're making sure that they are fully aware of what we found, and of course our leadership with an OSD, but I'm, as chief, I would just tell you I'm most concerned about keeping faith with uh, pilots and their families, and so we're going to make sure that we have a real concerted effort of doing just that. So, Sig, just a few moments left. Final thoughts on that uh, clip we just heard, and then anything else about this story? Well, I was struck when he said that we lost the families. Um, you know, they 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 lost the pilots though too, and and uh, you you and and they and they haven't gotten them all back. Uh, the the fact that these pilots uh, sat with me one afternoon, uh, and they did so on my back porch at my house. The fact that they did that and spoke their minds as clearly as they did, doing so on background because they did not want to be identified. They feared retribution, and rightly so. But the fact that they did that says a lot. Uh, they did not understand why they weren't hearing more about the problems that, that had been uncovered in the investigation. And they felt like that as people who are an integral part of this story, they have a right to know. Uh, they're the guys flying the planes. And some of them don't understand at all, for example, why they're allowing a kid with 25 hours of flight time to solo in that airplane while breathing the oxygen in that mask. Uh, if that person gets into trouble, they will not survive. And, and you know, that's, that's what we're talking about here. These are experienced pilots, and they're concerned about their students. And then as one of them tells me, his wife said, hey, why are you, what are you talking about your student for? I'm concerned about you dying aren't you? And so I, I think that they were lost uh, in the 2010 period because there were a lot of questions about what happened with that uh, flight. Uh, nobody really had an easy time understanding what happened. And the Air Force came back and said that it, was, uh, it had nothing to do with the oxygen system. Well, a lot of pilots didn't really believe that, by the way. And in fact, an inspector general came in and said, uh, you need to look at that again, because we don't feel like you really 
gave it a lot of time. You didn't study that really hard. The Air Force Investigation Board went back to the drawing board. They came back and said, no, we stand by what we said. And yet the pilots here have come to me, something that never has happened before in my 21 years on this job. And they complained to me and, and they didn't hold back. So I think that General Goldfein should be concerned that uh, in this latest incident, they may have lost some of the pilots at least. And they lost their families along with it because the families are mortified. They, they worry about their, their husbands and wives who are already doing a dangerous job being put at risk unnecessarily. And that's the story we're following.